Let's take our Bibles tonight and go back to the book of Psalm, Psalm chapter 107. Did not get to finish last Sunday night. Looking at 10 things that we can praise the Lord for and give sacrifices of thanksgiving based on Psalm chapter 107. <clears throat> We're going to read verses 1 through 3 to start with. <clears throat> Again, being in the Thanksgiving season, yet every day in the life of a child of God is a season of Thanksgiving. But just looking at 10 things that we should always be thankful for and always praising the Lord for, never forgetting these things. Last week we looked at God's presence in our life, His protection, His power, his provisions, and his leading. And tonight we have five more things to look at. And we'll kind of touch base on the first five I mentioned. Well, let's read verses 1 through 3 of Psalm chapter 107. And the Bible says, O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy, and gathered them out of the lands from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Father, again, we ask that you would bless our time together tonight. Uh, Father, we don't take it lightly. We do want to hear from heaven. We want you to speak directly, individually to each of us, Lord. We thank you for the relationship that we have with you. We do thank you, Father, that you are personally involved in each of our lives. Lord, that you do take interest in our lives, Father, and you do want to lead us. You want us to follow you. You do want to show yourself great and mighty in our lives, at the same time, you want us to take time to just sit and be still and to remember that you are God and that you do have all the answers. And Father, you do want us, Lord, to be full of joy as in the presence of the Lord there is fullness of joy. So Father, thank you for taking interest in our life and caring about us and wanting to see us, Lord, finish the race that you have put us in to finish the course that you've set our feet upon. And, Lord, you've given us the prize to look to, and it is the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I ask that you would please bless our time, for it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, this is something that all of us already know, but to always be giving praise and thanksgiving to the Lord, because that is what the Lord desires from his people. He desires that those that have seen the goodness and tasted the goodness of God would give praise and thanksgiving and and honestly, it is what helps when you're faced with difficulty. It is what helped Paul and Silas at midnight sitting in a Philippian jail to have their focus on the one who's always faithful instead of looking at the darkness that they were sitting in, not knowing what would happen to them on the next day, just offering up praise and thanksgiving to God. And, and again, God caused an earthquake. He caused the doors of the prison cell to open up, he caused the Philippian jailer to hear what Paul was saying and to want to be saved. And the Philippian jailer, we don't know his name, but his name is written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. We know that he accepted Christ as his Savior. And God just uses different things in our life to remind us that it's not just sitting in church on a Sunday night with our hymn books open that we sing to the Lord, but it's even in the darkest of nights that God wants us to open our hearts and open our lips, our mouths, and to sing praises to his name because he's worthy of all honor, glory, and praise. And believe me, I am not perfect in this area. I am just like anybody else that finds things to complain about but then is reminded by the Lord that there is to be no complaining but there is to be praising because there is a God in heaven who has all the answers. Uh, there is nothing impossible for God. God loves to show himself great and mighty in the impossibility so that his people will praise him. And that's what he says four times in this chapter, chapter of 107, the book of Psalms, there's four verses that are repeated and then there's four other verses that are repeated. When you look at verse 6, 13, 19, and 28, the, these are the words of these verses. It says in verse number 6, 
it says, Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. The same words in verses 13, 19, and 28. So four times in this chapter, those words are repeated. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. In verses 8, 15, 21, 31, these words, these words are repeated. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. God desires for us to give those sacrifices of thanksgiving and praise to him. And sometimes, as we're going to see in this chapter, he allows things to happen so that we will turn to him and cry out to him and cry out in our trouble that he would deliver us. And then when he does, he desires for us to worship him. In verse number six, in verse number, or I'm sorry, in verses four through seven, verses four through seven, we see God's purpose. We can praise the Lord and give thanksgiving that God has a purpose in everything that he does in our life. Looking at verse number four, they wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. That sounds kind of bleak, doesn't it? They found no city to dwell in. They were hungry. They were thirsty. Their soul fainted in them. But notice verse 6. Then, when they experienced wandering in the wilderness, and they experienced being hungry and thirsty and their soul fainting within them, then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. It wasn't until the people cried out to the Lord that he delivered them. He always wants to deliver. He always wants to help, but he waits until we choose to cry out to him. And as his people cried out to them, he delivered them out of their distresses. So we can praise the Lord that for the purposes that he allows in our life, it is for our good and it is for us to turn back to him, to cry out to him in a time of need, knowing that he has a purpose for what he has done. Again, not to destroy, but to save. In Jeremiah 29, verse 11, the Bible says this in regards to God's purposes. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. And when you think about the verses in Psalm 107, that was the expected end that God gave to them. He delivered them out of their distresses. He delivered them out of their distresses, verse 7, and he led them forth by the right way that they might go to a city of habitation. Again, tonight we can praise the Lord for the purposes that he allows in our life because the purposes that he allows in our life is always to turn us to him. It's always to get our focus on him because as humans, we tend to wander from the Lord and the Lord draws us back and sometimes he uses difficulties to draw us back to him, again, not for our destruction, but for our good and for his glory. Again, the Lord says, I know the thoughts I think towards you and I'm glad it's thoughts of peace. I'm glad it's not thoughts of destruction. I'm glad that God's not waiting to throw a hot thunderbolt my way to, to strike me dead. Or as I've even heard some, some men say over the years, you know, God, God just stands there waiting to hit me upside the head with a two by four. That's just not the character of God. The character of God is to show himself great and mighty in our life, is for God to show his goodness to us because he has thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give us an expected end. And that expected end for his people is to go to a city of habitation. Do you know what city that is? It's the heavenly city. God has prepared a place for his people. You may have a home right now that if it's like mine, it needs a lot of work. You got to keep up with the maintenance. Things break. But there's a home in heaven that is perfect, that you and I will not have to do any maintenance work to it because the carpenter has built a perfect place for his people. Look, if you would, at verses 9 through 14 of Psalm chapter 107. 
as we look at praising God for his rest, the rest that he gives to our soul. Sometimes there's sometimes we don't have physical rest. Sometimes the body is going through some difficulties, but there's rest to the soul. Notice what it says in verse 9 through 14. For he satisfieth the longing soul and filleth the hungry soul with goodness. I know there again, before I keep reading, there's times where we want God, you know, to take care of the physical need. But the greatest need is the need of the soul, is the need of the soul, and the Lord knows that. Because only Jesus Christ can satisfy that longing soul. For he satisfieth the longing soul and filleth the hungry soul with goodness. Such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron. Because they rebelled against the words of God and contemned the counsel of the Most High. Again, you think about a child who goes against the instructions of a parent. They find themselves in trouble. They find themselves having more trouble than they thought that was worth it. Again, when I was thinking when I was a child, and my mother told me, do not touch the stove. Don't put your hand on top of that stove. And, and I remember very vividly standing there after she said that, and she turned, and I put my hand up there. And I'm glad that my mother had told me not to do that, but I did not listen, and I burnt my hand because she had that burner that was on, right? Therefore, because they rebelled against the words of God, could tend the counsel of the Most High, therefore he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down, and there was none to help. Then, again, there's a purpose for everything God allows. Remember, you go back in just verse 11, because they rebelled against the words of God, and contemn the counsel of the Most High, not listening, not, not taking to heed the goodness that God was trying to do. Therefore, he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down, and there was none to help. Then, then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. Again, not for their destruction, but for their good, that they would turn back to the Lord because it was at the bottom of the barrel that they cried out to the Lord. And we serve such a gracious God that he's always willing to save and to deliver. Not to hold things over our head, not to condemn us, but to save us. He saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and break their bands asunder. He gives that rest Unto the soul that is needed. Because when we do not obey the words of God, again, God's word, you read scripture, it's not for our destruction, it's not to keep us under his thumb, it is for our good. Because God does not desire that any of us would have our life wrecked, that any of us would be harmed in any way. Again, when we tell, when we tell a child, do not play in the street. Why do you tell a child not to play in the street? Because as a parent, as an adult, we know cars go up and down the street, and as a driver, sometimes we don't see things that are in the street because we're not paying attention. Have you ever seen someone driving down the road reading the newspaper while they're driving? I have, and I have backed way off because like, hey, they're not paying attention. We tell our kids not to play in the street because there's danger. There's the potential of danger. And what happens when a kid is not thinking and they run after that ball that has been kicked or thrown towards the street? They're just thinking about getting the ball. The Lord has told us things for our own good. There's not one of us that's perfect. We have done things against what God has said that has brought harm into our life. But then, at some point, you've cried out to the Lord to help you. And God is always there to help. He's always there to bring rest unto the soul because God does not want us to be in any spiritual agony. He doesn't want us to be wrestling on the inside. He wants us to be obedient to him. 
In Matthew 11, verse 28, Jesus said, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I'll give you rest. Sometimes it's, yes, he does give physical rest, but the most important thing that he gives is that spiritual rest, the rest to the soul. Have you ever been in that point? You don't have to nod your head or anything, but have you ever been at that point where, where the inside of you was in such turmoil, you just... You found no rest. You couldn't sleep. Your thoughts were even tormenting you. And yet when you cried out to the Lord, the Lord was there to help you. Because that's God's desire, is that we would cry out to him. And again, and like I said earlier, in this chapter four times, it is mentioned, then they cried unto the Lord. Because people can be stubborn. I can be stubborn. Jonah. Remember Jonah? Jonah was stubborn. Jonah did not want to do what God told him to do. He was a prophet of God. He spoke for God. He was willing to speak for God until God told him to go to the city of Nineveh, which he did not want to go to. Therefore, he decided to go in the opposite direction. He paid the fare. He got on the ship, headed to Tarshish. And when a storm arose... The men on the ship were casting lots, trying to figure out, you know, whose fault is this that we are in this this huge storm that they knew was beyond the normal storm. And when they called Jonah up on deck, because he was down below sleeping, and they called him up on deck, and they wanted to know who he was, what's your name, where are you from, and when he got done telling them that he was a servant of God... But they feared. But Jonah said, just throw me overboard and the storm will stop. So they did. And guess what? The storm stopped. And as the Bible says, God had already prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah and it swallowed Jonah. And Jonah's probably thinking like sometimes we do, whew, good. All right, I'm off the hook because you know what? I'm swallowed by a great fish so I don't, I don't have to. May even have the excuse, well, God, see, you know, I'm in, a great, I'm in a great fish now, so I can't even do what you want me to do. But when you read the scripture, it wasn't until three days later that Jonah finally prays. Because he realizes, God's not letting me go. God's not going to let me off the hook of what he wants me to do. Because when you read the book of Jonah, it's then. Then Jonah prayed. And then God spoke to him again. The same words, I want you to go to Nineveh. I want you to preach the words that I will give you. It's then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. Sometimes I believe that we give too much credit to the devil when we start blaming the devil for difficulties in our life, for things going wrong, when sometimes we do have to look to God and Lord, are you trying to get my attention? Lord, are you trying to speak to me? Lord, is there, is there something that I'm not doing that you asked me to do? Because when we find ourselves not having peace on the inside, God promises to give peace. Jesus promises to give rest. When we find ourselves, when we find that peace seemingly evading us, we do have to cry out to the Lord and to see, Lord, what is it that maybe I have done against you or have not done that you've asked me to do. Jesus says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. We can praise the Lord for the rest that we have in Jesus Christ, for the comfort and the peace that we have on the inside, the peace that passeth all understanding. We can also thank the Lord for the cleansing that we have through Christ. We look at verse 17 through 20. It goes on and says, fools, because of their transgression, because of their iniquities, are afflicted. Their soul abhorreth all manner of meat, and they draw near unto the gates of death. Then, then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saveth them out of their distresses. He he saveth them out of their distresses. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Again, we can be thankful for the cleansing of the Lord tonight because in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, the Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
again, when you get to 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, there's not a sinless Christian. There's not a sinless, born-again believer. We're all saved by the grace of God. We still have sinful flesh we have to deal with. We still have to bring, as Paul said, bringing the body under subjection, doing what God has asked us to do, not giving in to temptation, but resisting temptation. The Bible says resisting the devil, drawing nigh unto God, and he'll draw nigh unto us. But we can be thankful that we have that cleansing, that you know what? When I do mess up, when I get angry and I shouldn't get angry because the righteousness of man worketh not, or the, 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 anger, uh, the anger of man worketh not the righteousness of God. I mean, whatever it is I do that the Holy Spirit convicts my heart about that that was wrong, that I have forgiveness with God, that I can cry out to the Lord and ask for that forgiveness, and he does forgive he cleanses because God does not want us to give any room to the devil in our life. God says, let not the sun go down upon thy wrath. Give, give not place to the devil. But he says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, we have an enemy. We talked about the enemy this morning that wants to get into our mind and cause us to think things they're not true, and the one thing he wants us to believe is that God's not going to forgive you. You've been struggling that, with that for a long time, and God, God's just, he's tired of forgiving you. We serve a God who is gracious, who is long-suffering, and he already knew what he was getting when he saved me. He already knew the work he was going to have to do in my life to transform me into the image of Christ. The devil is the accuser of the brethren. But God says, come unto me and I will give you rest. God says, I'm faithful and I'm just to forgive your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Look at verse 23 through 30. Verse 23 through 30. They that go down, <clears throat> they that go down to the sea in ships and that do business in great waters. These see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commandeth and raiseth the stormy wind, which lifteth up the waves thereof. They mount up to the heaven. They go down again to the depths. Their soul is melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wit's end. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble. He bringeth them out of their distresses. He maketh the storm a calm so that the waves are of or still. Then are they glad because they be quiet. So he bringeth them unto their desired haven. Again, praising the Lord for his goodness. In those verses, you see just the goodness of God that though we have struggles in life, yet God brings us to the desired haven. In Psalm 84, verse 11, the Bible says, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly thanking the Lord tonight for his goodness in every day you know what there's not a single day in our life that God has not been good to us now the devil's the accuser of the brethren the devil will bring to your mind things in your life to try to get you and me to think well God wasn't wasn't there in this time God didn't help me with this God didn't keep this evil from happening to me God didn't keep that from happening but God's goodness, God uses everything. Remember, God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man with evil. God is not the accuser of the brethren. God's not the father of lies. He's not the author of confusion. The devil is. You and I have experienced the goodness of God from the moment we were born. We have experienced the goodness of God. Some of the difficulties in my life that I experienced was because of my own doing, my own choices, right? It's not because of God. And we have to remember the goodness of God. And I do believe that all things work together for good to them that love God, who are called according to his purpose, all right? We all have bad things that happen in our life, but God can use it for good to strengthen our life. Again, when you read these verses, some of these verses seem kind of bleak. Where 
because they rebelled against the words of God and contemned the counsel of the Most High. I mean, just things, fools, because of their transgression, because of their iniquities are afflicted, right? Someone not listening to counsel, yet choosing to go against wise counsel, and they end up being afflicted because of their own foolishness, because of their own iniquity, yet then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saveth them out of their distresses. There's not a single person in this world that is more faithful than God to be there, ready to help, ready to save. Now, we know some people that would probably be there for us, that might forgive us, but even people's forgiveness runs out at different times. Remember what Peter asked the Lord? Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother that sins against me? Seven? Because seven is the, is the number of completion. So I've completed it, and then after that, I'm justified in whatever I say or do to them. Right, Lord? And the Lord said, no, but 70 times 7. Because after 490 times, we've learned to be patient. We've learned to have grace and forgiveness like the Lord because the Lord has been working on us. Again, we all have experienced the goodness of God. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. He, he protects us, provides for us. The Lord will give grace and glory and no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. You're walking with God. Not saying that we're perfect, but we're choosing to walk with God. We're choosing to rely upon the Lord. He does provide good things for us. And you have experienced the goodness of the Lord. Even if, even if he doesn't do another good thing for us from this moment on until we see him in heaven. He's already done way too much. Because he's given the gift of salvation. That's the greatest thing that he's done for people. For the human race to give the gift of salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. We truly have experienced the goodness of God and he deserves our sacrifice of thanksgiving. Lastly, I want you to look at verse 33 through 38. As we think about God's faithfulness. That we can thank the Lord for his faithfulness. In verse 33, it says, He turneth rivers into a wilderness, and the water springs into dry ground, a fruitful land into barrenness for the wickedness of them that dwell therein. He turneth the wilderness into a standing water, and dry ground into water springs. And there he maketh the hungry to dwell, that they may prepare a city for habitation. And sow the fields, and plant vineyards, which they yield fruits of increase. He blesseth them also, so that they are multiplied greatly, and suffereth not their cattle to decrease. You and I can thank the Lord for his faithfulness, that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We serve a God who never changes, and I'm glad his word never changes. I'm glad that you and I don't have to be worried that when we see him face to face, the plan of salvation has changed. You know, some people change their plans. Some people even change their promises. They promise you something, and then when it's time to pay up, they change it. Nobody likes to be lied to. Nobody likes to be done wrong or taken advantage of, and we serve a God who never, never will take advantage of us. He'll never do us wrong. And I say us, not just us in this room, but all his people around this world. Because you go back to verse 1. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy, and gather them out of the lands from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south, all of God's people. He is good to all of his people. He's faithful to all his people and his presence. Again, the goodness of his presence in our life. There have been times in my life, especially in my younger years, where I ignored the presence of God. I know God's there. But then you ignore it. Who likes to be ignored? If somebody is in your presence and you're talking to them, and they're you know, kind of looking around, you know, looking at their watch, you know, that, that's kind of annoying, isn't it? It's like, wait a minute, you're not paying attention to what I'm saying. What's more important, right? 
We don't want God to feel that way because our Lord and Savior has done so much for us that he truly does deserve our sincere gratitude, our sincere worship of praise because he's the one that's always faithful and he proved it on the cross of Calvary. Can you imagine three and a half years walking with the Lord? And in John 6, 66, the worst verse is recorded. All his disciples left him. Then you get to the Garden of Gethsemane, and the other 11 scatter. But those that had been walking with him for three and a half years, besides the 12 disciples, the other people, the ones that had been cleansed, the ones that had been healed, the ones that had been fed, those that were just enamored by the Lord, just everywhere he went, just sitting and just feasting upon the things that he would say. Yet when he said, except you drink my blood and eat my flesh, you cannot be my disciple. Not letting themselves think about it, not letting God speak to their heart, just got offended at it and they left him. but yet the Lord was still faithful to die on the cross for them. Still faithful that he would even die for those that were nailing him to the cross. Oh, we serve a God who is faithful. There are times in our life, in, in 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 22, I'm going to read this in a second, but there's times in our life where we may feel like God's not there. We may feel like God's not listening. Have you ever prayed and it felt like your prayers were bouncing off the ceiling it just felt like they weren't getting up to heaven they just just felt like you know God wasn't listening but yet God is listening because faith is not about feeling is it faith is about believing I know that God has ears to hear and I know as long as I'm not regarding iniquity in my heart the Lord hears me it's just the Lord may be waiting and when God is waiting, it's never wasted time. God has a purpose for everything he does, and the greatest purpose is for us to be drawn closer to him, for us to realize that, you know what, I, Lord, I need you more now than ever before. I need you in my life. I need you to guide my steps. I need you to give me the wisdom today. God doesn't want us to get into the routine of just, Okay, I know what to do. I know when to stand up. I know when to sit down. I know when to do this. I know when to do that. Because church is predictable. The only thing that's not predictable is where you're sitting. Some people sit in the same spot, but as it was even mentioned tonight, people flip, flip places. But aren't you glad that God's predictable? He's predictable in the fact that he's faithful. He's faithful in what he says, he's faithful in what he does, and he's faithful in your life and my life. 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 22 says this, For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake. You know, they were first called Christians at Antioch because they bore the name of Christ, because they put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You bear the name Christian tonight. It doesn't matter what other denominations false religions want to, want to call themselves Christian. Christian is still a disciple of Jesus Christ, according to Scripture. And if you bear the name of Christ tonight, he remains faithful to you. Faithful to always deliver, faithful to always provide, faithful to always encourage, and faithful more than we realize to carry us along the path that he has set our feet upon. In Psalm 107 again, verse 21 and 22, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. And let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. Paul and Silas, with rejoicing, declared the works of God in that prison cell. All throughout Scripture, you see men and women just rejoicing in the Lord. God knows exactly what your life entails. Other people may not know all the details of your life, but God does. And he's the one who is faithful 
to give us the grace, to give us the wisdom, to give us the encouragement and the peace on the inside to know that he's always there helping us, guiding us, drawing us closer to him. He's the one person we should never push away. He's the one person we should always draw nigh unto because he draws nigh unto us. Father, we do thank you this evening, Lord, for just, and just these ten things that we looked at Tonight and last week, Lord, just ten, 10 things to praise you about. Lord, would you help us individually, really, to, to think about our life, think about the things you've done, and to praise you for them and to thank you for them. And Lord, I know there's been times in my life where I've said, Lord, I don't know if I've ever thanked you for, for doing this for me, but Lord, I want to thank you now in case I didn't. But Father, you're so good, and Lord, I, you do deserve all honor, glory, and praise. And, Father, you do have thoughts of peace towards your people. And, Father, none of this is anything new to us, Lord. We know that you're faithful. We know that you're always there for us. Lord, would you help us to walk in that truth? Help us to walk in the truth that we serve an amazing God who is there to help us, to guide us, to love us, and to conform us more into the image of Christ. Well, that's the greatest thing, Lord, to be more like Christ, to have the grace and the peace and to have the, the will to fulfill your purpose in our life and to let you shine through our life, a life that's been transformed by the power of Christ. Thank you, Father, for all that you do for us. As the piano begins to play, give you a few moments alone in prayer.